So anyway, we're in this series called Making Life Work. And we just, in the way of a quick review, we, we, we start off by saying everybody needs help getting through life. Amen. We all need to know how do we navigate through life? How do we make decisions and choices? And what template do we use for designing how we're going to go through life? Especially when there's so many people out there trying to tell us how to live. Right? When there's so many powerful forces trying to move us in their direction. And we ask ourselves, how do I live? How, how do I navigate? What do I do? And what we need is what the Bible calls wisdom. Wisdom is applied knowledge. It's simply defined. It's applied knowledge. Anybody can get knowledge. I mean, the days, you don't even have to have an encyclopedia. Just remember Encyclopedia Britannica's? You'd spend hundreds of dollars for these encyclopedias. Remember those days? And they'd be outdated in a couple of years, but you had to have them, right? But now you can have any knowledge you want on that phone. Oh, it's called Google. You know, anything you want to know, it's there. There's no shortage of knowledge. But the thing is, how do I use that knowledge? And what knowledge is trustworthy? And what knowledge will lead me down the right path? Isn't that right, church? Amen. We're inundated with information and statistics. But the thing is, how do I live? Who do we trust? Who do we listen to? And that's what the Bible calls wisdom. And that's what we've been studying from the book of Proverbs. It's wisdom, practical knowledge of how to get through the day. The other, the other day they were talking about Tom Brady, quarterback for New England. And he recommends 37 glasses of water a day. 37 glasses of water a day. Well, it's been all over the, the feeds that if anybody other than apparently him really drinks 37 glasses of water a day, you're going to die. That's too much water. But he's telling folks this is how to excel. 37 glasses of water a day. And the doctors are saying, no, no, time out. Don't listen to him. So you got to be careful, don't you? Who you listen to. Proverbs chapter 1, 1 through 7 is the verse we we've been using. It says this, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, first week we talked about the principle of taking the initiative from the book of Proverbs. How do you make your life work? Well, one of the things you have to do is take the initiative. Somebody say amen, don't fall asleep. Amen? amen. Take the initiative. Get off your tail. Get out and do something, right, church? Amen. Don't sit in front of the video game and expect all of a sudden for life to just work out for you. You know, check in the mail. It doesn't work that way. The book of Proverbs tells you, get out, pray, seek God, and take the initiatives. Amen? Amen? That's number one. Second thing we talked about after taking the initiative was learning to choose your friends wisely. We talked about the importance of who we have around us, the people who have our ear, the people who speak into our lives. And that's not just a thing for young kids or teenagers. Adults need it too. We've got to be careful who we allow to speak into our lives. And we talked about having a life development team. As understanding the people who are closest to you, those three or four people that really matter, they are speaking into your life and helping your life become what God intends it to be. Not everybody gets to have your ear that closely. So choose friends closely helps to make life, choose friends wisely makes life work. Third one, last week, we talked about learning to speak the truth. Learning to speak the truth. Life works best when we speak the truth. We talked about not speaking lies. We talked about learning how to speak the truth with love. Choosing the right moment and addressing issues when you have to. And we talked about how important it is to have people around us who will speak the truth to us. Isn't that true? There's got to be people around us who can speak the truth and we can hear that in our lives. And so that brings us to this week. Do we have a thumbs up on this? 
All right, so this week's topic, I've chosen a two-minute video to introduce it. See if you can guess what we're going to talk about from this video. set it on the coffee machine, it'll work, I don't think. But if you see people do crazy things when they're angry, boy, I have. I have seen the toddler in the grocery store throwing a tantrum in the aisle, yeah? I have seen the teenager do crazy things out of frustration and anger. Once upon a time, I was so mad at my sister, Kathy. We were eating dinner and around the table, and uh, she was doing her teenage arguing with my mom, as kids will do. And I got so frustrated with my sister, Kathy. I was probably 15, 16, she was 13, something like that. I reached over and grabbed her cup of milk, and I poured it right over her head. Oh. <laughs> and I'll never forget, she just went, because she couldn't believe I'd actually do that. But I was so frustrated with her, so angry with her. And, and also, I've seen adults do some pretty silly things when they're angry. Have you? Yep. 
How many remember the classic scenes of Lou Pinella angry storming out of the dugout at Mariners games? How about when he kicked the, uh, the base across the thing and threw his hat? Remember those days? It was so funny to watch, but it's really kind of silly when you think about it, right? I once saw a grown man take a, a tennis racket. I was playing him on a tennis court, and we had rackets in those days that would cost $400 each. These rackets, they were, they were made of expensive materials. And I was, I was beating him, you know. And he took this racket and he slammed it against the pole and wrapped it around like a pretzel. $400 racket. I was sitting there watching, I was trying not to laugh at him because he looked ridiculous. But you know, when you're angry, you don't think about how you're looking, right? No. Nope. Just think about expressing that anger. In fact, you know, we have a kind of a word uh, that we use. We say somebody has, they're mad. Well, he's really mad, or she's really mad. But you think about it, the word mad means what? Insane. You know, it's almost become a, syn a synonym. To be angry means that you've become insane. Anybody here ever done something borderline insane when you're angry? Oh, come on, most probably of us have. We think about it, about it later. But it's interesting is that the Bible does not equate anger with insanity. It's very interesting. In fact, the Bible doesn't even equate, equate anger with being a sin, necessarily. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. See, what the Bible teaches us, we're going to walk through this, is it's actually possible to be angry but not sin. It, anger itself is an emotion. The sin comes in how we choose to deal with that emotion. Proverbs 16.32 is our key verse, if you're writing this down, that I wanted to show you on the subject. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. It says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Look at that one more time. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. I love that phrase, he who rules his spirit, he who can have control of himself or herself, who rules their spirit. It wasn't something that, uh, that I was always able to do, and I guess that's why anger is something that I speak on often, because I was an angry young man. Anybody else remember being an angry young man or an angry young woman? I was an angry young man. God bless you. In fact, my, my issue was profanity. And I, I shared this before with some here, but others are new. Back when I was in high school, I had the sailor mouth you wouldn't believe. Which some find shocking, because I haven't even uttered a swear word in decades. I don't mean that to brag, it's just it's not in my computer anymore. But back in those days, my mouth was foul. And it would come out in public places. Uh, and one time, I was playing, again, just because I played a lot of sports, I was playing tennis. You know, when you play tennis, you're in a public place. There's people standing around, they're watching and everything. And I'm out there playing, and every time I would miss a shot, I let out a string of expletives, you would be shocked, okay? And it wasn't just once in a while. And it was not under my breath, if you know what I mean. And so I was doing this, and I wasn't even thinking twice of it. I was the epitome of somebody who did not rule their spirit on the tennis court, okay? And so I was just going along and doing that. And uh, what I didn't know is I had just received Christ a few months before and I was just starting to walk with God. And the man who was mentoring me and teaching me how to be a Christian, he had driven up to come see me play. And I had my back to where he was standing. And I got on a string of expletives. I mean, that would have just curled your hair. Taki would curl your hair too. And, and as I turned around, there he is standing there. And I thought I would just dissolve it like that. Because I knew that was out of line. Even though I was doing it. And he just looked at me and shook his head. You know, like, what are you doing? And it really, really got in under my skin. I didn't change right away. But I became aware in that moment, you know, that I was not in control of my tongue. I wasn't ruling my spirit. Here's a few checklists. A little anger checklists before we... Uh, talk more about it. Just see if any of this applies to you. Have you lost your temper lately? Have you screamed <laughs> irrationally at a spouse or some kids or a friend or a co-worker? 
Have you struck somebody <coughs> in anger? Have you left your spouse or someone else shaking because of the force and vehemence of your words? Have you taken angry snipes at someone who's there actually to serve you, like, like a bank teller or a cashier or a waiter or a waitress? Have you cut someone off angrily on the freeway, given the universal peace sign? <laughs> Have you ruined a formal get-together by your angry outbursts? Are people around you walking on eggshells? Do people around you not speak honestly to you for fear of what you say or do? Is your circle of friends getting small and smaller every day? Is your stomach constantly churning? Do you have problems with your health, with your back, or with headaches? Those are just a few indicators of anger out of control. And maybe some of them apply to you. Proverbs chapter 14 says this, He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. Exalts folly. Okay, number one. What do we know about anger? First of all, God created us with the capacity to get angry. God made you with the capacity to get angry. You might be shocked to think that, but actually the ability or the capacity to feel anger and experience anger, that came from God. Did you know that scripture even says that God gets angry? It does. A couple of verses. There's several. You can look them up. But Psalm 35 says, 30 verse 5, says, For God's anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a life. Jeremiah 23, 20 says, The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he's executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In that latter days, you will understand it perfectly. Yes. So God gets angry. And guess what? You and I were created in the image of God. And that ability to have anger is part of being that creation in his image. You know, some folks think that being created in the image of God is like how we look. They think, you know, being created in the image of God has to do with our bodies. But the reality is that's not true at all. Being created in the image of God has to do with who we are inside. Our souls, our spirits, our intellect, our emotions. That's what it means to be created in the image of God. You can choose right or wrong. These are the things that God created in you and you're in His image. And anger is also something that God allowed us to experience. But when God is angry, His anger moves Him to His righteous works. See, God's anger moves Him to righteous works. And when we experience anger, it can also move us in a positive or a negative direction. Because anger is all about having passion and energy in that moment. Isn't that right? Amen. And that anger can move in a positive or negative way. Did you know that Jesus Christ, our Savior, got angry? Yeah. Sure he did. Sure he did. We don't like to think of it that often. We think of him as the meek and mild, you know. But he had times of great anger. There was a time when Jesus came to the, uh, uh, the temple. And they had set up stores in the temple courtyard. And were selling stuff in there that they shouldn't have been. And Jesus went off on them. Remember this story? Yep. He cleared the temple out. He knocked over the, he cleaned it out. I got to tell you what, I think he was angry, but it was righteous anger. Are you following me? The energy, the passion to do what God was calling him to do. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus went into a synagogue and there was a man there who had a withered hand. And these Pharisees were watching him to see if he would dare to heal this person on the Sabbath. And Jesus became angry at them, at their attitude of their heart, that they would be questioning if it was all right to be good on the Sabbath. And it says Jesus became angry with them. So you see, anger in itself isn't a sin. Anger is an emotion that's a neutral thing, but it's how we go forward from that anger that's important. Are you following me? Amen. See, anger can take us to what we've called before a Popeye moment. How many here remember Popeye, the cartoon? I know it's my generation, but some of you may have seen it maybe on YouTube or something, right? Popeye. And Popeye had a famous saying. You remember what it was? He would say, that's all I can take. I can't take it no more. 
And then he would pull out the spinach, right? And, and he'd get strong, right? But you know, we can have moments where we see something or part of something or where anger rises up in it, in, in us. And that anger can be righteous anger to push us forward with passion and commitment to do what God's calling us to do. See, anger doesn't have to be in itself a negative thing. Uh, Bob Pierce founded World Vision back in the 50s. World Vision, how many have heard of World Vision? A tremendous outreach work with food and clothing and global ministry. Bob Pierce founded it back in the 50s. And what happened was he was on a missions trip and as he was walking through a destitute village of people starving without clothes or fresh water, he writes how inside of him an anger rose up. And he thought, why is it that I have new clothes and fresh water and I've got food to eat and these people are starving? And he said, it isn't right. And Bob Pierce went back and formed the beginnings of what we call world vision. It was a righteous anger that rose up inside of him. It was like a Popeye moment. This is all I can take. I can't take it no more. And he made a change. I follow him. So not all anger has to be bad. That God created anger. But if we're going to be honest this morning, our, this time we have left, most of us know we don't always ha handle our anger very well. Right? Most of us do not handle our anger very righteously. In fact, there are two basic ways that people handle anger. People are either bottlers or spewers. People who bottle it up or people who spew it out. Which are you? Think about that for a moment. Are you a bottler upper or a spewer outer? Bottlers are people who, when they get angry, stuff it down inside. They stuff it down deep inside and think, if I don't address it, it'll go away. If I don't acknowledge I get angry, I won't have to deal with it at all. You know what? In my family, we were bottler-uppers. We were. We were trained that. In fact, if you got angry and started to raise your voice, uh, my parents would say, I love my parents, but they'd say, if you're going to raise your voice, go to your room. That's what they'd say. And so we were kind of drilled, you know, don't show your anger, don't express your anger, because it... You, you know, you're going to get in trouble just for being angry. So we were taught to be bottle uppers. But I got to tell you what, you can't bottle up your anger and not have a consequence. In fact, anger bottled up is like nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. I, I have a friend of mine, uh, Wesley and Seth, who pastors a church down by Hanford, Tri-Cities area. And you know, they got that nuclear waste site down in Hanford. And they're having so much trouble down there with this nuclear waste that they had bottled and they had dug it down deep in the ground. And now what's happening is it's leaching out, isn't it? And it was just on the news a couple of weeks ago where a whole bunch of workers are suing the government because they're getting nuclear poisoning. And they thought they were, you know, free and clear from it, but they weren't. And see, that's what anger bottled up. It's like nuclear poison inside of our soul. You think you got it bottled up way down inside and never bothered you? The fact is it leaches out. And it poisons you, and it poisons the people around you, and it begins to just leach into your atmosphere of your home because of bottled up anger. People that bottle up anger have symptoms. Let me just throw a few at you. Okay? Bottle up anger, now, you may not necessarily apply, but think about this. People with bottled up anger often have headaches, digestive disorders, they lose self esteem. They're cynical, depressed, because what happens is this stuff like nuclear waste bottled up inside eats away at you. And I know from experience. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other way we do is spew it out, which is the opposite of the bottlers. The spewer outers or spewers are people who they don't have any problem letting people know they're angry. Okay? They just let it fly. Like a burst up dam. They just Dump it all over. They got no bottled up problems there. These are the folks who kick the dog, slam the door, tear out this, you know, these guys on TV. Oh, we had show it earlier. The spewers. But the problem with spewing is the person spewing might feel better, but everybody around them walks around damaged and beat up. Amen? Amen? Proverbs addresses this. Proverbs 22. Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, do not go, lest you learn his ways. 
and look at this, and set a snare for your soul. 29.11, a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Yes. The thing with spewers is people around them end up walking on eggshells. People around them end up afraid to be intimate or to express feelings for fear that the spewer is going to explode all over them. Now, I won't ask if anybody here is this, okay? But we know some like that. My third point is that both bottlers and spewers, they're extremes, and neither one works very well because of this. Both spewers and bottlers are failing to learn what God wants to teach them through anger. Either denying it or spewing it in both ways, they're failing to learn what God wants to teach through that angry moment. You see, anger, the feelings of anger, what are some of the feelings that you experience when you're growing anger inside? Physical feelings, what are some of the things? Let's go ahead around the room. What are some things you feel when you're growing anger? Hot. Hot, flushed. Yes, exactly. What else? Flustered. Flustered. What else? Pain in the neck. I'm sorry? A pain in the neck. A pain in the neck. <laughs> Literally. Yes. Yeah. Muscle tension. I'm sorry? Muscle tension. Muscle tension. Yeah. Yeah. What else do you feel when you're growing angry? How about increased heart rate? Yeah. Yeah. Heart rate. Uh, some call it seeing red. I mean, you don't really see red, right? But you just, ugh, the whole thing. Right? There are physical symptoms of this. And this is God's kind of like blinking red light in your dashboard of your car. You know how you have that little light that comes on and says service soon? And when we feel angry emotions, that's like a red light blinking, saying, pay attention here, you got something to learn here. When we feel those angry emotions. And when we feel anger, we have a couple choices. One is we can go with it and spew. Another one is we can bottle it up and deny it. Or we can say, Lord, what is happening in this moment that's causing me to feel anger? What is happening around me or in me that is causing this to generate inside of me? Proverbs 16.32, again, let me remind you. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. So when we feel anger welling up inside... We can ask ourselves some questions. Am I feeling ignored? Am I feeling pain? Am I feeling demeaned? Am I feeling fear? What am I feeling that's bringing these angry emotions to the surface? And if we can identify what's going on there, we can learn to control our anger. Now, I gotta close with one last thing. There is one cause of anger that I see more and more, that is an unrighteous thing that I wanted to warn us of. I think it's become rampant in America in the last couple, three, four years. It's what I call the but I deserve it anger. The but I deserve it anger. This is anger that's caused by an attitude of entitlement. We're not genuinely afraid, we're not genuinely being hurt in some fashion. We're not genuinely being frustrated. What's happening, though, is we are feeling that we are entitled to something and we're not getting it. Amen. And therefore, we are angry. <laughs> things we're entitled to that, that we think we're entitled to, that we're not, things like our comfort, our schedule, our agenda, our convictions, our goals, our preferences. Now, here's the thing that I wanted to say as we kind of wrap this up that might help with anger. Okay, now listen, this can really help. You or I, we are not the center of the universe. Amen. Oh. No. <laughs> wow. That makes me angry sometimes. You know what? There are other people around us. And they are also living their lives. And they also have what they have to do in the day. They have their emotions. They have their issues. They have their problems. And you know what? They're not just there to make us comfortable or to meet our wants and our every needs. <clears throat> Ever thought of that was flipped around? They're thinking that about you. Amen. 
See, so there's so much anger because of this entitlement mentality when the actual thing is, as Christians, we're not here to feel we're entitled. We're here to be servants to people. Let me just close with a story about anger, and it'll maybe bring this home, then we'll pray. So before, about, about eight years ago, actually, I was at the Fred Meyer in Kent, where uh, we lived near there. And I went in the evening. I used to like to go in at night because it was a crazy, busy zoo all day long. But at night it was empty and you could do things, right? So I went in there. It was late. It was after our Sunday night church service there in Kent. And I grabbed some items. And I was in a hurry to get home. So I, I grabbed my stuff. I got in. There was only one checker because it was late. Have you been there? Nobody's. It's just one checker. And I got in this, this little line. I'm holding the stuff. And I'm noticing that the person in front of me is writing a check. And you know what that means. Slow. Slow. And I also noticed that the gal checking them out had a big old trainee badge on. So she's trying to handle this check, you know, and doesn't know how to do it. And I'm standing there getting impatient and frustrated. Why? Because in my heart I'm saying, I'm entitled to quick service. Right? Mm -hmm. Come on, you've been there. That's why you're smiling at me. And you're saying, hey, I'm entitled to better than this. And I'm standing there as she's trying to write the check and she's trying to figure out how to do the thing. And then what really got me mad is you hear her, she grabs that, that telephone thing, flips around and goes, uh, cashier help on aisle five. And then you know you're really going to be there for a while. So I'm standing there, I find myself tapping my toe and getting flushed. And I'm thinking, can't you get another cashier up here. What's the deal with this? I come in here all the time and all this entitlement, angry stuff is flooding my mind. And I'm standing there trying to be Christian. I've got my suit on from church and I'm, and I'm just eating up inside. So the person comes and they're trying to figure out how to do the check, you know, and the whole thing. And I'm just standing there getting angrier and angrier. And finally they finish and it's my turn. And I step up there. I've just got a few items. I set it down. And you know what? You're human too. I want to just let into that girl. You know what I'm saying? I want to say, what's your problem? What's the deal? And as I get up there, I see she's got this trainee badge. And I look at her eye. And she's a young gal. She's got a little tear that I couldn't see, you know, from back there. And I looked at her. And all of a sudden, that gentle voice of the Holy Spirit, you know, spoke to me and says, you're going to yell at her? <laughs> and I looked at her again. And I could see she's flushed. All of a sudden, my whole thing changed from being about me, right, and how inconvenienced I was, to here's this poor thing, probably her first night on the job, you know, and she's overwhelmed, and she's just galling the check. And now I'm stepping up there, I'm going to really holler at her. Maybe my face showed it, you know, I don't know, but she had a little tear there. And I, I looked at her, and it all melted away. And that, just a moment, you know, and I realized, what am I doing, you know? And I looked at her and said, because I've been that checker. I mean, I did that once. And I looked at her and I said, having a rough night, she looked at me and says, you have no idea. <laughs> the tear came rolling down. And I said, well, don't worry about it. You're doing fine. And uh, I'm okay. She says, thank you for being so patient. And I wasn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wasn't patient. But to her, you know, just a kind word, you know. Listen, church, you know, we're not entitled. We're here to serve. And, you know, we got to control our anger and bring some light and joy to the world. What do you say? Amen. You know? So let's do this. Let's close in prayer today. And let's be like the person who can rule their spirit, control their anger. And let's not be taking this out on the people around us. What do you say? Amen. Listen, if you're the person here who's spewing, you know, uh, let's be in prayer on that. And let's see if we can get you some help. And listen, if you're a person here who hits people when they're angry... Let's talk about that too. Okay? There's no place for it. No place for it. Guys, we don't hit women when we're angry. And vice versa, because I've seen it go the other way. No excuse for that. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how you're teaching us to control our anger. Lord, forgive us for the times when we've let anger get out of control and made a mess for others and ourselves as well. And Lord, help us be men and women who can rule our spirit, control our anger. Lord, thank you for how you've called us to be lights in the darkness, to bring joy and serve other people. 
And Lord, we're just asking that our awareness will grow in this area. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.